Good morning, everyone. Hello, welcome. Uh, we are going to be here with Ophelia this morning. I just have her in a little crate right next to me. Uh, but come on in, let me know that you guys are here and I will give you all a shout out. Uh, we love hearing where you're from and, um, and how you heard about the center. So definitely let us know uh, where you're from. We love to see folks from all over the country on here. It's really cool. Um, so we have, oh, it just started drizzling. We have, um, we have Ophelia with us this morning, so she'll be coming out in just a sec. Um, just want to give folks a chance to come in. Good morning, Katie. Hello. Um, so Ophelia is our Virginia Possum Ambassador, and we are um, super, super excited to possibly have a new, another one as well, which is just going to be awesome. But um, she just got checked out by our vet yesterday. Good morning, Katie from Kittery. Hello. Um, so hopefully in the next week or so, we'll have um, an official letter for her. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Kara. Okay, so we're going to have Ophelia with us this morning. Good morning, Ophelia. Hello. So Ophelia uh, had a mouse last night for her dinner, and she got some schmutz on her nose, and I just spent a good five minutes trying to get it off and um, was less than successful because she does have a lot of teeth, and I'm not about to, you know, put my fingers near that, but so if you see some schmutz near her face, that's what it is. Ophelia, come back here. Come here. Come here. I know. So you can see she's using her nose to figure out where my stash of food is. Hi. I know all you guys can see right now is gray fur. Hi. Can you come here? Look at the camera. Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sophie, you're making this really challenging. Sorry, everybody. We're trying to figure out how to film this, uh, this silly, crazy opossum. Here we go. <laughs> Come here. Hey. Ophelia. There you go. Oh, yeah. There's Ophelia. All right, we figured it out. Hi, Kara. Hello. Good morning. Yeah, we're back outside today. Okay, we got Ophelia in a relatively stationary position. <laughs> she is um, very sweet. She has been with us since she was um, about three months old. Ophelia is, our, is a Vir Virginia opossum, for those of you guys who did not hear. Um, Virginia opossums are known to be um, scavengers. They're known to... Uh, to look around for food in your neighborhoods, in your trash cans, in your dumpsters. And they get a pretty bad reputation because of this, because they are um, a scavenger, but they're actually really wonderful animals. They are super helpful in maintaining um, low levels of insect populations. <laughs> Hi, I know you just want fish. Yeah, come here. So um, you can see she's using that amazing nose to find where this food is that I have for her. And in the wild, they would do the same thing. Hi, Susan, hello. Um, in the wild, they would do the same thing. They would use that impressive nose to scent out carrion, which is what we call dead stuff. Hi, come here. Uh, carrion, she would use that nose to scent out trash or leftovers that humans had put out. And because they are scavengers and they are so good at locating their food, they, often um, are found near people. They're really more of an urban animal than a lot of other wildlife. So, um, for example, I live in... Hi, come here. Come here. I know, you know where the cup is. Yeah. I live in um, Haverhill, Massachusetts, and I've seen opossums waddling down Main Street in Haverhill, which is pretty urban. So these guys are a very urban species. They, um, they like to live near people. They like to live near trash. Um, but they are super helpful to us and they only really have been able to become so common and so uh, prolific up here in the Northeast uh, because of humans and because of our activities. So um, 
These guys are called Virginia opossums because they originally only really came up as far north as Virginia. Virginia was the first place that our settlers really encountered them. Um, but they can actually um, survive in colder areas if they have enough food, if they have enough shelter. They can survive up in, here in the winter. And so what happened is when we started developing along the seacoast, when we started um, building like interstate highway systems, these guys were able to just follow our trash right up to, uh, now they're all the way up into Canada. So these guys um, have adapted to humans really, really well. And as long as there's plenty of food for them to, uh, to find, they will, um, they will, they will do it. Is it, Max asks, is it unsafe to, uh, to pat her? Yeah, for the most part. And she doesn't really love it. Um, opossums have the most teeth of any animal. So I don't know if you guys can see her teeth, uh, but they have the they have the most teeth of any mammal that lives on land. So um, it is generally unsafe to um, to handle her without gloves or to yes hi to pet her. She doesn't love to be pet, so um, she's you know usually not on board. Um, and then we always are, we always use for um, food whenever we're dealing with her and long tweezers um, to kind of get her to go where we need her to go. And we don't handle her, like pick her up without gloves on. Um, so you can see she has a crate right here. She, I lured her into the crate with food. I lured her out with food and now she's just sitting here for food. So we try to handle her as little as we possibly can um, just to limit that. And she's not a biter. She's not gonna bite unless she thinks that your finger is food. So if your finger smells fishy, she might. That's why we always use um, the tweezers. So we don't want anybody losing any fingers. Hi. Um, let's see. Did you have to let the mouse decay a bit before she did? Um, Kara, no, she's not like a turkey vulture who needs their food to kind of like break down a little bit before they can eat it. Um, if she gets, you know, a frozen and thawed mice, she's happy. These guys will eat pretty much anything that they encounter. Um, and they have all of those teeth in their mouths that allow them to grind and chew and all of that. So they are very good. I have an egg for you. Would you like an egg? Yeah. They are very good at, um, at grinding up things. It, it's okay if it's a little bit, if it's a little bit fresher. Hi, what's that? Oh my goodness. Um, so egg is actually a big part of um, the opossum's diet in um in the wild obviously not hard boiled but um in the wild these guys will actually climb into the lower branches of trees and raid nests and they'll eat um eggs that they find in nests so these guys are fantastic climbers um and you can see this beautiful tail that she has this uh kind of naked rat tail is really good for climbing. They use it um, like an extra hand to help them balance. So they can use that kind of like a monkey's tail to hold on to a tree trunk and then they, um, or branch, and then they'll use their amazing hands to climb. So they have really incredible hands that look almost like human's hands. Um, on their back feet, they have an opposable thumb just like ours, so they can grab and hold on to tree branch branches. And then in the front, they have these really dexterous fingers as well. So you can see her little toes. She, um, they can do a lot with those. So they like to hold on to things and um, eat things that way. Um, Anne asks, what is the lifespan in the wild versus captivity? That's a really good question. So Virginia opossums are curiously short-lived animals. They have very short lifespans in the wild, usually only about like two to three years. And what's fascinating about this is that it has a lot to do with their genetics. So we as humans um, have evolved to live long lives because there's a benefit to it. There's a benefit to living longer than um, you can reproduce, longer than you might um, you might expect. And um, we, our genetics show that. Our genetics have, um, have evidence of that in them. These guys, because they are relatively unable to defend themselves, really the only defense that they have is that ability to play dead um, and those teeth, of course. They are very, very susceptible to predation in the wild. So in the wild, they could get preyed upon by pretty much anything. And the only thing they can really do to protect themselves is play dead. And that's not always a very effective mechanism. They do, um, they do play dead and 
kind of uh, have evolved this like stinky goo that they emit that smells like rotting meat. So hopefully um, something will back off. But they um, they actually, you know, it doesn't always work. And these guys usually um, don't survive very long in the wild because they are kind of like everybody's favorite food. It's kind of like a rabbit. Um, and so their genes actually never evolved to age the way that ours do. So these guys, even though they look like an animal, like a cat-sized animal that might live a longer lifespan, they only live about two to three years in captivity or in the wild. And in captivity, that isn't extended too much just because their genetics aren't adapted to live that long. So even if they don't have predation, if they don't have disease, if they have plenty of food, they still don't have the genetics that allow them to live extraordinarily extraordinarily long lifespan. So I've heard of like four or five. Um, the females will live longer than males, but it's still not a very long life. And um, it's it's really interesting because, hi, I know, I know. They um, The way they figured this out is that opossums that live on the mainland have to deal with predators all the time. They have to deal with um, bobcats and lynx and um, you know, in southern areas, they have to deal with mountain lions, things like that. But then on these islands along the Atlantic coast, there are some islands that have opossums, but no predators. And they, um, over, you know, a few thousand years, have evolved to live a little bit longer. Um, so it's really cool. Uh, they also have a very, uh, because they have a short lifespan and because they, um, they, hi! because they make so many babies, um, they, you can start to see evolution happening very quickly in these guys. Hi, I know, come here. Yeah, you're very cute. Uh, let's see, hello from Texas. Hello, Teresa, New Jersey. Hello, Priscilla. Um, Kara, I have never seen Ophelia play dead. Um, the first thing that an opossum does when they feel threatened is not necessarily play dead. The first thing they usually do is a uh, hiss, but it's not really a hiss, it's kind of like a, like a cough sort of hiss, and they go And um, I have heard her do that. She does not love to be picked up, so sometimes she'll do that when we pick her up. Uh, make that kind of like a hiss sound. I know. Yes, you smell, there, there's more fish. Um, so she's never played dead for us, um, which is a good thing, but part of the reason that we have Ophelia is because she does not fear people as she should. She was raised in captivity, um, she doesn't really know that she should be playing dead or be afraid of people or predators. She really, um, yes, I know you smell it. She really is, uh, hi, not very, um, not very well adapted to, or not very well, uh, educated to, to live outside. So she was raised by humans and they kind of taught her that people are really nice and will give you food. Hello, uh, Erica, nine kiddos. Good morning, everybody. Hi, welcome. So we're here with um, Ophelia, our Virginia Opossum Ambassador at the Center for Wildlife. Uh, we are located in York, Maine, so we're a little bit far away, but we have um, 30 non-releasable ambassador animals that live with us permanently for a bunch of different reasons. Um, and Ophelia is one of them, and she lives with us because she, <laughs> because she is too friendly. Yeah, and thinks that um, thinks that she should be hanging out with people and that people are nice and will give you food, just like I'm doing now. But um, the, unfortunately, okay, come here. Sorry, guys, I got to wrangle her. Unfortunately, when these guys um, are raised um, to think that humans are really good and nice, it's really hard to break them of that um, and kind of train them the opposite. So... I know. Good girl. Uh, thank you so much, Kara, for donating. That's so sweet. We um, we do have a donation button on all of our videos, so um, if you're able to donate, we really appreciate it. It goes right back to the care of all of our ambassador animals, like Ophelia here. It also goes back to the care of our patients, and we usually get about 2,000 patients every year in our medical clinic, so people will bring us animals that they find that are hit by cars. Oh, yeah, you found the fish. Yeah that are hit by cars, that are um, caught by cats or dogs, that are um, in any sort of um, accidents, fall from nests, things like that. So we get about 2,000 patients every year. A lot of those are birds. We take care of a 
any type of bird that you could see in our area. Hi, and then we also do take small mammals like opossums, squirrels, chipmunks, um, things like that. Nice job. Uh, good morning, Kim. Hello, good morning, Amara. I know her ears are so cute. So these guys actually have really, really good ear um, hearing. Um, I, yes, it makes me uncomfortable when you sniff that close to my face. I know. Um, so they have very, very good hearing and a very good nose, but actually really terrible eyesight. I don't know if you guys can see this, but Ophelia does look like she's a little cross-eyed. And that's not necessarily because she is cross-eyed, but um, they do have really, really terrible eyesight. What's that? Oh, the fish. Um, so they are primarily using their hearing and their, um, their sense of smell to get around. And their eyesight is, you know, not super great. Um, Ophelia does look a little cross-eyed and that is down to the fact that she actually has these fat deposits next to her eyes. Opossums are really strange. They are marsupials, so they're not like us. They have a pouch um, that they carry their babies around in, and uh, marsupials often store fat in weird places on their bodies. Um, so they store fat next to their eyes, on the like in their tail. It's really it's really weird. So Ophelia has um, has these little fat deposits next to her eyes that make her look a little cross-eyed, but she's she's her vision is okay. It's just it's evolved to be very poor. Good morning, Naomi. Hello from Rhode Island. Good morning, Erica. Good morning, Yvette. Hello. Uh, I know you're so cute. Yeah. Um, hi. The other thing that um, is interesting about them as marsupials is that these guys will um, will have a bunch of babies at a time. They will um, they will give birth to as many as like 20 babies at a time. But when they give birth, they're really, really underdeveloped and tiny like a fetus. They're really, really little and would not at all be able to survive. Um, but then they climb into the pouch on mom's belly and they, um, they will suckle in there for another month or so. As they get older, they grow fur, they you know develop their eyes and their organs and everything. Um, and then they can, they can have as many as 13 babies emerge from the pouch. Um, and what they do after that is they will ride around on mom's back. Once they've kind of come out of the pouch and are ready to be on, on their own, they'll, they'll ride around on mom's back and they will, um, I know, they will uh, try to hi, hang on with their little paws um, and kind of get a sense of how they're supposed to go about being a possum. Um, sometimes they'll fall off, um, and because there are so many of them, sometimes mom isn't, you know, going back to make sure that all of her babies are accounted for. Um, so we do get some singleton babies that are just misplaced, um, and we can take care of those guys. They shouldn't necessarily be on their own when they're that little. Hi! We have a, a measurement of like, I know, seven or eight inches is what we say is how long they should be before they're on their own. Um, uh, Kara, yeah, so Kara, I just hinted briefly, and we haven't really unveiled her yet. Um, we're still waiting on a letter from our veterinarian saying that she is going to be living with us, but um, we have a potential new opossum ambassador, and she will live next to Ophelia in, where Artemis is, but, um, and then we've moved Artemis inside for the winter because she doesn't like the cold. Um, and her enclosure will be next to Ophelia's but it um will not be with Ophelia because these guys are known to cannibalize each other if they get too hungry so um we do not house opossums together they are also not very social in the wild they don't like to be necessarily with other opossums they really only raise their babies um that's the only time when they would be with another member of their species so hopefully we'll be able to unveil her soon she's very cute um very cute and sweet uh, but we're just waiting on that. Last step. Oh, that's so cool. Beth caught one on her game camera the other night. Yeah, so we do see these guys um, more frequently near our homes than other animals. They're a little less shy. They're really, um, really good at figuring out that people have the food. So, um, so they, they will often, uh, live near people, live near our trash, live near our compost piles. So if you do have a game cam, you would most likely see these guys waddling through. They're very sweet. 
Um, they also, because they are wandering around on the forest floor a lot, good morning Chuck, good morning Amara, hello. Um, because they're wandering around on the forest floor a lot, they, um, they do pick up a lot of insects doing that. So you can imagine if you're wandering through the brush, if you're wandering around at night, you might pick up, um, you might pick up some insects in that understory brush. So they actually pick up a ton of ticks and when they, um, when they are wandering around, do you want to go back in? I know. And they pick up those ticks on their bodies, they, um, they will actually groom themselves and pick them off and eat them. So they actually consume about 5,000 ticks every season. We're not completely sure on that number, but that's the estimate is that they can eat as many as 5,000 ticks um, you know, a year. It's really incredible. So they do a lot of good pest control for us. If you have them in your backyard, it's a really good um, sign that they, um, that they're helping you take care of your tick problem or your pest control. They're a nice free way of um, getting some pest control. What are you doing? Where are you going? You can see her, con you know, exploring. She ate the fish that was available and now she's kind of, she's like, where's the rest of the food? I know. And you can see her holding on with her little hand. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're a little piggy. I know. Um, so they do have really cool hands. They also have these back feet that look like um, that look like hands. That ha They have opposable thumbs on their back feet, which is really cool. You're so pretty. I know. But um, we often will get these guys in our medical clinic, especially in the winter. They are not evolved or adapted to live this far north. Um, they really have only come up this far north in the last 40, 50 years or so. And um, they still have these, you know, these adaptations to help them climb, like this tail um, and the ears and the toes. Um, but they will often come in with frostbite because they are just not really adapted to survive up here in the winter. You would never see a long naked tail on an animal that lived in, that was evolved in New England. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Mara, that's so sweet. Uh, yeah, she is so, so cute. Come here. Come here. And she is a very uh, food-motivated animal ambassador, like a lot of our ambassadors are. And um, we'll often, once she's kind of done with her treats, she will, um, she'll go back into her into her little house and be done. I know it is, it is sad that they're short-lived animals. Um, we've had a female opossum live to four, uh, before and Ophelia here is about three. So, um, she is definitely older. Um, and we, um, you know, she's still very healthy, still does great, a great job of getting around, but they just, um, their organs just don't, don't turn over. We, um, our opossums usually pass away from like heart failure or something like that, um, just because they, they are not supposed to live that long. Yeah, come here. I know, there's still more cat food, but you ate all the fish. She loves her protein. What do you think? <laughs> um, these guys have, yeah, she is, Kara, she'll wake up for any food. Yeah, and Chuck, you do see them a lot um, getting hit by cars. They are nocturnal, so they are awake at night and wandering around at night and on the roadways. Um, often they're very slow. They um, don't necessarily see cars coming, so they unfortunately do get hit by cars frequently. If the tip of the tail is left to, lost to frostbite, are they releasable, Susanna? Yeah, usually um, frostbite on opossums is actually really common, and if it's on just the tip of the tail, the first few vertebrae, it's usually it's usually okay. They can still use it. They can still get around, um, and we just you know make sure that it's not um, you know spreading or necrotic or anything like that. Get it healed up and then release them in the spring. Um, so yes, absolutely. If it's just the tip, of, even like a couple toes, they would be fine with losing, or a tip of an ear, or something like that. Um, it's just a very common, it's just a very common injury that we see. Do they have an odor to them? No, Chuck, they are actually incredibly clean animals, so they don't really smell musky, they don't want to attract scents or anything like that, so they, um, or predators, so they usually don't, you're gonna, they usually don't make much of a scent. They're really clean animals, they actually will use, um, like a toilet area of their habitat we, that we call a latrine. They tend to go to the bathroom in the water um, to avoid attracting predators to their scents. 
Um, so they are very clean animals. They also groom themselves fastidiously and very often. So um, they don't really build up any sort of an odor. Um, they don't get a lot of the same diseases that a lot of other animals will get because they are marsupi marsupials. So they typically don't get um, rabies or distemper. Um, so you don't really need to worry about them kind of spreading illnesses to your domestic animals. Um, they very rarely get mange um, or any sort of those like skin parasites because they groom so much. So they are actually very, very clean animals. They do a really good job of taking care of their coat and their skin. And so they really don't have much of an odor um, to them at all. Really the only thing that is smelly about them is their, is their, um, you know, their poop or their pee. And they are usually pretty good about kind of keeping that located in one area. We actually give Ophelia, she doesn't usually use it very often, but we give her a little pet pan of water that she can go to the bathroom in if she wants to. Um, she definitely goes to the bathroom in like one area of her enclosure and then that's far away from where she eats or sleeps or anything like that. So she has her like one area where, where she'll go and then um, it's really convenient. We just have to clean that up um, and yeah, so she's a pretty clean, she's a pretty clean girl and they all are like that. They're, um, they're trying to keep themselves clean and keep their fur clean and then they, because they're scavengers, they can eat anything that they find on them and then they also don't want to attract any predators, um, by being that stinky. So, you know, animals that do have a lot of a scent to them often will you either be using that scent as a, um, as a defense, like a skunk, or they'll be predators. So like our minks and our, um, martins and our weasels they are predators so they um they don't necessarily need to worry about making too much smell or our porcupines so i can just speak from experience about the porcupine smell <laughs> um they have that amazing adaptation of um of all the quills so they can attract their mates with their with their scent um but they don't necessarily worry too much about about those um about predators because they have all those crazy quills on them these guys really don't make much of a scent at all. And it's like uh, rabbits. Rabbits don't make much of a scent either. Those strictly prey animals tend to um, be very clean and not stinky. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you guys have any other questions about Ophelia, we're happy to answer them. She um, is expressing a little bit of interest in going back to bed now that the food is mostly gone. We've given her a few different things today. We have cat food, apples, egg, fish, um, some sweet potato, which she is not a fan of. She um, has left the sweet potato behind, uh, but she did enjoy everything else. Um, so if you guys have any other questions about Ophelia, please let me know and I'm happy to answer them but she is just expressing some interest. Oh, how much does she weigh? Will she bulk up for the winter? Yeah, <laughs> she, um, I just weighed her and she's like 3000 uh, grams or three kilograms, um, which is not that much, but it's a little bit more than I would like. So, um, so we are, you know, gonna be giving her some more exercise and uh, trying to get her weight down a little bit, but in the before the winter, it's not necessarily a bad thing for them to have a little bit of extra fat on them. And opossums, uh, because they store fat in such odd places on their bodies, um, and not like all throughout their bodies, it's hard to kind of um, kind of get that fat off of them. So, um, thank you guys so much for joining. Um, and yeah, if you have any other questions, please let me know. She's definitely expressing interest in going back to bed. Yeah, I think we'll take a little walk though to work off some of that food that you just ate. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for um, for joining and we will see you all again tomorrow. Kristen will be back with another one of our ambassador animals. Um, but thank you guys. We'll see you later. Have a great rest of your day.